This is Joseph Giacobelli. I'm an analyst, investor, author, and the host of the Asia Climate Finance Podcast, which is a philanthropic series dedicated to the promotion of knowledge and discussion on sustainable finance in Asia from the perspective of the business of decarbonization and the energy transition in the region, which consumes about half of the world's energy and electricity. Please support this effort by liking and by subscribing to the podcast. Hello there and welcome to the 26th episode of the Asia Climate Finance Podcast. For those of you who follow the Lunar New Year, allow me to wish you a very, very happy year of the rabbit. In today's episode, we have as a guest, uh, Ms. Mika Obayashi, who is a director at the Renewable Energy Institute in Japan. Uh, you can access some of the research by this think tank by going to www.renewable-ei.org, www.renewable-ei.org. And you'll find lots of very thoughtful and very interesting research reports and various proposals on their website. Today's episode is about Japan's government uh, policies and track record when it comes to uh, renewable energy. So that's the first kind of area we discuss. We dig down a little bit into Japan's domestic decarbonization kind of uh, objectives as well as its overseas uh, decarbonization aims as well. And um, Mika-san has offered some very uh, interesting insights uh, in, this, uh, in these areas. Please enjoy the show. Hi there, and again, welcome to episode 26 of the Asia Climate Finance Podcast. Uh, today, we are talking about Japan. And we're talking about Japan with uh, uh, Ms. Mika Obayashi, who's the director at uh, Japan's Renewable Energy Institute. Good afternoon, Mika-san, and thank you very, very much for participating in the podcast. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to this. That's great. That's great. I know you've been traveling a lot, so um, I'm sure you must be <laughs> quite, <laughs> quite tired and quite, uh, quite busy. So uh, again, I appreciate your 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 participation in the um, in the podcast. Um, if I could start uh, as we usually do to try to give listeners a little bit of a better understanding about you yourself. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about your background, please? Yeah. Um, so my name is Mika Obayashi. I'm a director at the Renewable Energy Institute. This institute is rather new, I can say. Um, we established this organization just after the Fukushima accident back in 2011 March. So it's about the 11 years, uh, no, no, 12 years ago now. Um, at the time that I was in Abu Dhabi, I was working for the International Renewable Energy Institute then, but uh, I was totally shocked uh, by the uh, Fukushima uh, nuclear accident. And I decided to go back to Japan because um, I thought that uh, my country is facing the crisis. And um, actually that I have been involved in the anti-nuclear movement and then renewable energy promotion and the climate change discussion for past 20 years. So it's almost 30 years now. <laughs> so I, I decided to go back. And then and actually that I saw that all the kind of presentations and the news information from Japan until I finally got back to Japan in August. And then during those five months that I monthly basis, I went back to Japan actually for the preparation. And then some, somehow I got the information that uh, Mr. Masayoshi Son, CEO of the SoftBank, uh, had, had the intention to set up the Policy Research Institute, especially on renewables. Mm -hmm. So I saw, 
I must join this mm. institute. Mm. So mm. I contacted him that through my previous uh, you know organizations friends and then and then I met him May, in May when I came back and then he said like uh, oh you can come back to Japan. So I thought that it's a kind of a signal that mm. you can join my institute or something like that. So I finally came back to Japan August 2011 and then joined to establish this organization. So as I briefly said, that this organization is especially focusing on renewable energy policy research because that, you know, we believe Japan has money, Japan has technology, but actually if you see the society and the economy, that renewable energy are not promoted on the ground. So I think, and we we thought that the biggest problem is there's no policies to mm. implement renewables. So we we wanted to rather focusing on the policy implementation of renewables. That is a background of our institute and my myself. No, that's 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 absolutely great, and I think we could talk about um, March 11, 20, uh, t- uh, <clears throat> 2011 uh for for hours uh i have a lot of very strong opinions about that and one of the saddest events um in asia uh, in the past uh decades um but uh let's let's be a little bit more cheerful let's talk about uh renewable mm-hmm. energy and how uh, renewable energy can actually help so perhaps we can for those you know listeners who don't really have uh, and you know, a good background on Japan. Um, I think most people will know that um, Japan does not have its own coal and uh, oil and gas, and so it has to import basically a hundred percent of its needs. Um, but perhaps we could start a you know a general discussion before we talk about policy and the government on um, just the development of clean energy in in Japan. You know wh- where. Did we come from? Uh, obviously, before 2011, it was a very, 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 very low base. <laughs> um, but, but um, you know, what has been the development of clean energy in Japan, Mikasa? Yeah. Um, so as a kind of a history of Japanese energy policy and development, uh, as you said, like uh, Japan is not energy sufficient. And then almost all fossil fuel energy that we import but in terms of the uh, electricity basis like kind of not the primary energy basis but the second en- energy basis uh the uh we have we, we had the 10 percent of electricity from big hydro mm-hmm. in past you know several decades it's a very stable and then it's a kind of a renewable energy and uh, after the March 11th of that Fukushima accident, uh, in 2012, Japan introduced the German type of feed-in tariff scheme for promotion of renewables. And then after that, um, so-called new renewables, such as solar PV and uh, uh, wind power, um, accelerated to develop. So the top on the 10% of hydro power energy, like uh, it's now like about 10 to 12% is coming from new renewables. But if you see the details or portion of that new renewables, most is covered by the uh, solar PV. And the uh, second is a bioenergy and then geothermal and the wind power. And uh, at the energy basis, like um, energy capacity basis, like gigawatt base, um, in 2010 to 2011, uh, Japan used to have the five gigawatt of solar PV, and it's mostly the rooftop solar because Japanese kind of a very environmental mm. interest people invested in the expensive rooftop solar mm. to do that. Mm. But after the installation of feed in tariff, that the first time that the solar electricity business came up, 
And、uh, in past decade, that Japan developed more than 70 gigawatt, 70 gigawatt of solar PV. So the, at the end of 2021,、uh, I'm sorry that I didn't have the end of 2022nd figure yet, but、uh, it was like a 74 gigawatt already. So I'm sure last year we increased that、uh, 6 gigawatt or something like that. So now Japan has the 80. 80 gigawatt of solar PV now. And then it is providing 8 to 9% or 10% of electricity to Japan. And then if I see the wind power, it's still minimum stage. We used to have the three gigawatt back in 2011, and now it's still 4.6 gigawatt basis. So probably it will be five gigawatt last year. So, compared to the solar PV, wind energy is very slow to grow. But、uh, so, as a whole, so with the、uh, big hydropower electricity and the new renewables, it is now the 20,、uh, around 22% is supplied by renewables for the electricity mix. So, the, especially the last decade after March 11th, Of 2011, it's really rapidly increased, I can say. So, for wind,、um, you know, obviously there's some uh, geographical, uh, geological, et cetera, limitations to have lots of onshore wind, but I know that there's a big effort to have offshore wind. And I think that effort, you know, they, they've been talking at least about it for the last three or four years.、Um, So, do you, do you think that now offshore wind is a pro- the priority when it comes to、um, clean energy in Japan? Yes.、Um, so, the offshore energy development in Japan has just started, I have to say. So, we have been talking about offshore wind like five years or something that after 2011. Uh, you know, that at the time that in Europe, offshore wind is taking off, but, but、uh, it, it's a kind of a, just a starting phase, I, I believe. And then, last five years, really offshore wind t a k e n off, and then we could see the gigawatt basis of p r o j e c t in Europe. And、uh, two years ago,、uh, China introduced the 17 gigawatt, just one country, <laughs> one year. That's a crazy development. And then maybe last year they did as well. <laughs> so it's really accelerated now. So, Japan, you know, we, we are just、uh, past five years that we are discussion phase and planning phase. And、uh, last year, November, first、uh, big scale of offshore wind started the operation in Akita. Mm, 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 mm. And at the same time,、uh, the Japanese government introduced the auctioning scheme two years ago. And then they call for a tender for the 1.5 gigawatt. By、uh, and the end of 2021, that they、uh, selected the Mitsubishi as the winner for all three pro- areas projects. And the last year, just one month ago, they call another tender. That is a 1.7 gigawatt. And then probably that it, the winner will be announced in the end of this year. So the,、mm. you know, after two years, that we could get 1.5 and 1.7 gigawatt. And then actually, the government target for the operation of the offshore wind by 2030 is 5.7 gigawatt. We、mm. think it's the small scale. Yes. So, we're just accelerating the development. And then, government is always saying, like,、uh, it's very difficult to get the consent of the local areas, like fishermen,、mm. local communities, and something like that. So, Japan is different from other countries in that way. But, but、uh, I think somehow it's true. But I have to say that the current scheme of development of the offshore wind is all the kind of a First stage of getting the consent from the local area mm, mm, and then、uh, see the investigation and the environmental assessment, all of the things are just、uh, thrown, thrown to the、um, developers. 
So mm. each company really responsible for that. And uh, several plural companies that get into the one place mm. and are living mm. there for five, uh, three years, four years, and attending the local areas festivals every year <laughs> and then <laughs> try to communicate with the local community and then get the consent from you know fishermen there so this is a situation so so we are calling for the government and the industry is calling for the government that the government has to be more responsible yes. to get that yes. yeah yes. communication with local <clears throat> area and I mean, well, also sorry yeah, go ahead go ahead please go ahead and also another difficulty is the grid planning and the grid connection. That that has been the huge obstacle for the Japanese renewables, especially for wind power, including offshore and onshore. So the, uh, I think that the, you might know the Japanese uh, electricity system is still divided into 10 parts and then 10 big uh, incumbent utilities basically has the obligation to adjust the supply and demand. And then they used to be the one company, the mm. uh, power generation, transmission, and distribution, uh, one company. So they, uh, the local monopoly, vertically integrated company. So they could have the all the information of the uh, consumers and also other power generators as well. So it's very difficult for the uh, decentralized renewables to get into the market and then connect the grid. So it's still continuing, I have to say. Uh, government introduced the unbundling in 2020, but still the incumbent utilities influence is quite big. And so the offshore wind um, developers including incumbent utilities, <laughs> are suffered from those barriers still. So I have to say that the government has to have the clear um, message, transparent market for the all the kind of generators and then the transmission operators, you know, that uh, this transmission system, grid connection is quite independent. Independently managed mm -hmm. and then open for all renewables. Yeah. In, in terms of history, if I am correct or if I remember correctly, I think that the ministry responsible for the electric power industry, METI, the Ministry Electric uh, of Economy, Trade and Industry, uh, METI has always been kind of passive. It's ask industry or whatever to do things first and then you know they will put kind of rules regulations guidance around that they haven't been proactive it's only the last few years that they've been pushed to be proactive and one of the things that makes me and that's my, just my personal opinion um one thing that makes me really frustrated about japan is like you said earlier you know funding is not an issue uh Technology is definitely not an issue. Uh, human resources is a lot of very, very capable people domestically, but it's not happening. And when we're talking about um, you know, clean energy in general, I mean, I belong to the school of thought that decarbonization, energy transition, getting to net zero, et cetera, the first pivot, it's not a chicken or the egg. The first pivot is government policy. And that's actually the reason why you... You, you went back to, to Japan in the first place in 2011, which is, by the way, admirable. Um, so in my opinion, in my opinion, it doesn't really matter if the government has is very strong at executing or very weak at executing, as long as the policy is there, as long as the policy is clear. And so from that perspective, could you maybe explain a little bit about the Japanese government's ambitions in terms of reducing Japan's reliance on on fossil fuels? Because, um, I mean, every I'm sure that anybody who knows about energy in Japan understands that relying almost 100% on imports, especially today, is not a good idea. And I think it was TEPCO, Tokyo Electric Power, which um, announced just a few days ago that they're going to be increasing electricity prices in Tokyo area 
by 30 percent so and the reason is because of the imported fuels so um again uh sorry for the comments plus the question so the question is could you uh explain a little bit about what japanese government's ambition in terms of reducing japan's reliance on fossil fuels and we, we could touch on topics like the uh, levelized cost of uh, of energy parameters or uh, the hope for nuclear or CCS, or also we can talk about the different hydrogens. I call it multicolor hydrogen because you know there's there's green, there's purple, there's blue, there's <laughs> all sorts of colors. So um, it's a big question, but could 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 you address that, please? Yeah, um, I'm sorry to say, but currently that I don't see that any signal from the Japanese government to reduce the rely on relying on fossil fuels. I mean, that they think that they are, they intend to reduce the percentage of reliance, but uh, I believe they continue to rely on fossil fuel uh, even by 2050. So that their former policy, I have to say. <laughs> So, uh, and then it's surprising to see the current energy crisis. I, I have to say that it is not the energy crisis. It's a fossil fuel crisis, I have to say. Yes, yes, this yes. Fos yeah, fossil fuel crisis really accelerated Japanese government to secure more and more fossil fuel in mm. coming years. That's really paradox. I totally uh, com convinced that there is a, a group of the people inside of METI, inside of parliament, that they are clearly thinking that they have to go for almost 100 renewables. Otherwise, there's no real independence of energy. But uh, most of the government direction and then some of the industry's direction is to go in for the uh, fossil fuel as it is. So probably that using the form of the fossil fuel is different because it's not the simple coal-fired power plant. It's not the simple gas-fired power plant. They are talking about that the uh, ammonia hydrogen based on fossil fuel. <laughs> and then <laughs> with that gray or blue, I, I have to say there's no blue hydrogen yet on the planet, I <laughs> have to say. But but anyway, so because that it means like a, a CCS, CCUS, there's no serious commercial scale of CCS, CCUS yet. But but anyway, so they are talking about that the blue or gray hydrogen ammonia to be incinerated in the uh, coal-fired power plant. I, I, I just really don't understand the kind of a energy um, calculation of that because we create some fuel from fossil fuel and then burn it in again in the mm. incinerator. So mm. it's a huge loss of energy that I have to say. But but the, that is the Japanese government formal uh, project and then plan. And uh, actually that the government has the some figures for 2050, uh, it is like a, in the electricity use, the renewable will lead 50 to 60 percent. Mm, mm, mm. And the others will be 10 plus something will be uh, delivered by the nuclear and then ammonia incineration. And it's about electricity. So not all the energy use will be electrified. So the other uh, energy use, such as industry and transport, still uh, largely rely on fossil fuel, fuel use. So, and then, and then, according to them, it's fine because all the emission will be absorbed and stored on the ground. It's a, it's a kind of a CCS mm, uh, mm, thinking. Mm. And then, according to the government calculation. Additionally, that they say, like, there's no 
kind of enough space in Japan to bury such kind of large amount of CO2 under the ground. So there is a suitable and a more cost-effective place in the neighboring countries, <laughs> especially the South, Southern Eastern con- Asian countries. Mm-hmm. So it is exactly written in the government document. I, I think it's, I'm sorry, insane mm-hmm. that the whole mm-hmm. world is going in for the carbon neutrality. And then actually Southeast Asian countries that have the huge, huge potential of renewable energy expansion the fossil fuel is more expensive than the renewables, such as solar, mm. and offshore wind in those countries. And then we try to lock in those countries to export the gas turbine and the CCS technology, the prototype of experiment or something like that. And uh, I am really um, afraid that, for example, this ESG7 discussion, Japanese government wants to put those kind of agenda, so-called zero emission thermal power to save Asia or something like that. So domestic policy really connected with their international energy policy now. Mm. That's to mm. say. Yeah. Mm. It, it's, <clears throat> it's mesmerizing. I mean, there's a lot of governments out there globally that are doing some things which don't make sense. But mm-hmm. the difference with Japan in my personal experience, and I started looking at Japanese electricity back in 1992, 1993. So mm-hmm. it's been it's been it's been a few years. And mm-hmm. uh, one of the things that just absolutely surprises me is the lack of vision. I mean, you know, Japan is very, very, very good at excellent at yeah. planning, yeah. at structuring things. But when it comes to, you know, uh uh you know when it comes to to that it's 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 very, very strange. Um yeah. uh, I'll get on to two more areas before we we kind of wrap up. Um we and one area is if you could talk a little bit about um nuclear because I think it's a it's an important parameter um in in japan and you know japanese kind of government ambitions on, on that versus the reality um and then there's another couple of questions that i have yeah if you could okay what are your thoughts yeah. About yeah yeah of course that we can have another session if you need <laughs> because next year I, I i'm rather flexible not not this week but anyway um so as for the nuclear power it was really sudden the uh, Prime Minister Kishida announced that uh, uh, Japan will think of the additional construction of new reactors, such as the advanced or kind of a, uh, uh, I, I don't know the English name, mm-hmm. but it's an evolutionary type of new reactors that uh, uh, we will commit to construct. And uh, also, that uh, we used to have the um, lifetime limit of reactors. It is the 40 years lifetime. Mm, and then mm. if the reactor passed the uh, regulation or something like safety standards that they can extend until 60 years, so 20 years expansion. But uh, uh, Kishida administration suddenly said that uh, it will be lift off, lift, lift off those kind of regulations. Mm. and. Uh, uh, it's because of the safety standard regulation that current react, some of the current reactors stopped for more than 10 years because of the after the accident. Uh, so those uh, years of 10, 10 years that uh, will be not counted as the air, a, a age limit. So um, even if the real Reactor age is 50 years, but the 10 years stopped that uh, that reactor is counted as 40 years old or something like that. So at the end, as a consequence, 60 years lifetime expansion is just a lift off, and then it could be 70 years or something like that. Uh, that's the uh, things that they are now talking about. And then after Fukushima accident, 10 reactors got the, um, uh, um, started the operation. 
And then actually 17 reactors, one seven reactors got the permission, but the only 10 reactors out of those 17 started the operation. So still the seven reactors are waiting for the operation. So um, the Kishida administration and the incumbent duty, those are the owner of reactors, thinks that the shut it down reactors has to start the operation and uh, get the electricity as soon as possible. Otherwise, that they have the limit of the age and then probably five years that they can produce the electricity, but uh, has to stop. It will become the huge, how can I say, the uh, stranded cost mm. for power companies because they invested a lot of money for the safety standards and then just five years operation. So they just take off that limit. So as far as I think, so, so the new construction of additional reactors, they say that revolutional reactor or the advanced reactors, but it's a kind of a similar uh, type of reactors that uh, uh, in Europe that you are constructing, uh, like a kind of an EPL or something kind of reactor. So mm -hmm. it's not new or revolutionary new. So I think that the government mentioned to construct those new reactors is to maintain the industry and technology and engineers and uh, those industry. So it's a kind of a signal, you know, we continue to um, promote nuclear or something like that. But uh, we are not sure it's really happened or something like that. Yes. And then so the real aim is to prolong the existing reactor's lifetime and then mm -hmm. reopening the shut it down nuclear. That is, uh, I think, the real intention to announce the nuclear thing. Yeah, again, it's a very, very sad state of affairs. But uh, mm -hmm. um, I, I know you're, you're, you're off on, on yet another trip pretty soon. So I, I, I had um, just one uh, last uh, big question. One is, you know, basically it's it's, what, what do you think that Japan can actually get to use 100% clean energy by uh, 2050, or at least be net zero um, by um, 2050? That's the first part of the question. The second part is just uh, just some some final thoughts, some wrap up, some conclusions from you. I have to say that if um, the current policy of the Japanese government continues. Of course, it's very difficult to lease 100 percent of renewables by 2050. As I said, that even under the electricity usage, that as they say, that the 50 to 60 percent is for renewables. It's very small percentage. I have to say, it's the figures for like 2025 in European countries, <laughs> and then because the now the uh, more than half of the European countries have the target of. 80% or 100% by 2030. So that Japan's target for 2050 is, you know, really very low, I have to say. So it's very difficult. But of course, there are always the opportunity, actually the huge opportunities to reach 100% of renewables by 2050. Uh, it's our study that done by two years ago. And then now we are do, doing the current, the different, another study the, of the grid management and then decarbonized grid system by 2050. Um, there is huge, huge opportunity that we can reach 100%. But for that, that we need the um, more, um, restructuring of the power market and then also the strengthening the grid as well as the changing the management of the grid. And then also we have to continue to tackle on the deregulation and the restructuring and then taking out the artificial barriers to implement renewables. And according to our study, the uh, half of the electricity, 100% uh, renewables, half of the electricity will be supplied by PV solar, and uh, others will be supplied by the so, uh, offshore wind and onshore wind. So for that future, that we need a 
more flexible grid system. And then if we can, that is really flexible if we can integrate the grid system with other countries as well. Mm, that, that That's great. So do you have any um, major, just to conclude, uh, Mika-san, any kind of takeaways or final thoughts or conclusions about the future? About the future. That's very or, difficult. Or, but, or, uh, or now, or, or, or the present about, you know, the government as well. Yeah, I mean, I mean that uh, now the Japanese government is saying that it used to be said like uh, Japan is different. But now they started to say Asia is different. Mm. Um, and then saying like Asia still needs to rely on, you know, the coal-fired power plant uh, fossil fuel use. I don't know. I mean, that uh, um, that what uh, Japan needs to do is to promote that the renewable energy technology and then also that run the energy efficiency and the energy saving technology from other parts of the world and then implement those renewables and energy saving as a domestic um, market and then strengthen the domestic market and then give the partnership with the Asian countries to grow further together. That, that's, that is needed. I'm sorry, it's really not concrete no no it's uh well i mean it'd be very difficult to be concrete but um so i, I really know you have to go mikasan so i wanted to say thank you very 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 much for your time for your great 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 insights and i think uh you know hopefully uh in in a few months we can do this again and uh, hopefully in a few months we'll have some positive news out of uh the Japanese government. So, uh, so once again, um, uh, thank you very much. Or I should say in Japanese, "Domo arigato gozaimashita, hontoni." And uh, and uh, we're looking forward to speaking to you again very soon. Yeah, thank you very much. Obrigada. Bye. <laughs>